All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, I think the first Hangout on Air in the Edu Edu on Air uh, program in the Teaching Strategies section. Um, so we're we're getting things started here, and today we're we're going to talk about building your own e-learning program and how to build e-learning, online learning, blended learning, all those things into one. Uh, I'm Rich Kiker. I'm the director of online learning at Palisade School District in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm also a Google certified trainer. Um, and I'm going to share some of the things that we've done at Palisades today, and I'm going to share some other ideas and, and, uh, and pieces to help everyone build your own e-learning program. So uh, for those who are in the Hangout, thanks for coming today. We may get joined by one or two more. Um, and then also, I want to just say, I mentioned this to a few of the folks already, but please interject at any time. As I'm talking, I'd like to make this much more of a conversation and a lot less of a presentation so that everybody has their questions answered. And, um, you know, ideas together and, and things like that. So, um, the presentation is here. Uh, the link that's on the first slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Andy and Stacy joined us a little bit after I told this to Andreas and Juan. But if you are uh, in the Hangout and along your file options across the top or along your options, you, you should see the Google Docs option. And if you click on Google Docs, it should open the presentation and you can view it in the window to follow along. Um, and then I will also if you click on the chat I've posted the link to that embedded presentation and a blog post that I wrote last night with some more ideas so that should help as well got it awesome awesome all right so when we're talking about e-learning I guess we should define what that is uh, and that's that's a tough thing to define right now I'll get into that in a minute um, but I really feel like at this point we're, we're, we're in a space where we're trying to calibrate a culture for e-learning and what I mean by that is people call a lot of things e-learning or a lot of things online learning, um, but it encompasses a, a many different options from flipped classroom, blended, hybrid, and, and all these things. And we're really not sure which one works the best. And we don't know what's good for kids. And we don't know how to connect to them fully yet. We know we need to provide these options. We know that it will give them the digital literacies and the abilities to succeed in this connected world that we live in. Um, and that's part of our job now, um, but we're not really sure what that is. So I like to think of it as we're going through this calibration process in education and trying to figure out how to do this. So um, at Palisades, we decided, rather than trying to figure out what the, the answer is, we decided to take a look and, and figure out the way that we can answer those needs for everyone in one shot. And we've really embraced the idea of what, you know, um, Chuck Schwein just wrote a book, uh, Chuck Schwein, and he had a co-author, uh, I forgot the co-author's name, I apologize. But it, the book is entitled Inevitable, Mass Customized Learning. Great read, quick read, um, and it talks about this idea that we are in a, in a shift in education where we need to customize an individual solution for every single student. And while that's not necessarily a new idea, where Chuck shares uh, some more powerful pieces is... Um, this idea, thank you, Andreas, for posting that in the chat. Where Chuck shares uh, some of the ideas that are new is this idea of taking a digital content or taking digital content, and digital curriculum, and then sharing it um, with readers to figure out how to do that for, for students. And we really embrace that at Palisades and have created this kind of mass customized solution for all of our learners. So I posted this continuum in the presentation here, the blended learning continuum. This is something that came from Blackboard. Blackboard happens to be our platform. And I'll touch on that, but you can see this, this touches on that idea of what I said. When we're talking about e-learning, there's this, this full range of different solutions, and there's really no one size fits all. Um, it's very individualized for schools. It's very individualized for students. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a very custom thing. So um, what I mean by what we've done is that we've taken all of these options, including blended, uh, open campus models, um, full K-12 digital learning and online learning solutions, and we put all that into uh, what we're trying to do at Palisades. I even put it here, you know, fully online hybrid M learning. We, we're hearing a lot about mobile learning now from iPads and Chromebooks. I know Andy has a lot of expertise in those areas. Uh, and then, of course, one-to-one -one as well. Um, all of those, I think, are what we can consider online learning or e-learning pieces or components. I see some viewers joining us live on, on YouTube now and the number's going up quick so I just want to take a minute to welcome everyone and if you have any questions you can please post them to the uh, 
to the Hangout comment section in Google Plus, and I'll be sure to look at those here periodically and try to answer your questions as well. So this idea of, you know, I mentioned that e-learning is exploding and we know we have to do it. Sometimes the question is why. Uh, this chart is, is pretty revealing. You can see the growth here in a range of uh, kind of, I guess, differentiated learning environments, we can call it, um, from homeschool to virtual school. And then to the right there, you can see the big player, blended schools, or excuse me, blended learning going from, you know, we're in the period now from 2010 to 2015, where that's going from, you know, 3 million students to over 10 million students. Um, and I think those numbers may need to be uh, adjusted now because of the growth. You see online charter schools, and that's, you know, on a percentage basis, even a faster growth than blended learning. So this is a, a hot topic right now, and, you know, part of that calibration process is figuring out how do we do this? How do we do this for our students so that we're not just uh, being fancy, that we're not just uh, saying we know what online learning is, but that we're using it for authentic student achievement and, and helping kids gain skills that they need. So, Any questions from people in the group so far? I just, I just might comment on your chart. I think it's interesting that, you know, the homeschooling is going up in the virtual school. And, and I'm from Ohio. We certainly see a lot of virtual schools and, and, you know, increasing, but also the blended schools. A lot of the districts that I work with try to add some sort of blended component. There's a couple districts even that have written it into their um, charter or whatever, said so they have to, students have to take some sort of online or blended course before they even graduate. I think that's great because when they come to college, one of their classes is eventually going to be online or somewhere else, and so it's better to get used to it early on. So I see it as a big positive. It's an awesome point. Thanks, Andreas. There's, um, you know, what you say there about college readiness. It's so critical, and it's something that I'm passionate about because um, if you think about it, are we going to be a school district or are we going to be a society where children are going to school, let's say even just for high school, grades 9 to 12, and they're going through their high school career, and they don't have any experience of online learning, and then they're going to university where I believe the number is something like 94% of all university courses last semester in the United States had either were either fully online or had a major online component, like it was managed and organized in Blackboard or Moodle or some other platform. So sure. it's a great point when we're talking about college and career readiness, and when that's in our mission statements for a lot of our schools, I think we should take a look at that and say, you know, is this really what we, are we really doing this? And that's a good point, so thanks for sharing that. Here's just a, a brief, uh, you know, image representing some of the things we're trying to do at Palisades, and we look at it as, you know, it's not just educators and administrators who are leading the charge here, but we involve our community as much as possible. We've invested in cyber centers where uh, students can come in and work with their teachers during the day in the kind of comfy, Coffee, coffee shop style kind of environment so that they have that blended feel. Um, and they, but they, have, they continue to get that face-to-face -face support, which I think is critical. Even with full online students, when they know that they have that full support and they have that option to connect with a teacher in the building, um, it adds value to their education. You can see here the students obviously are the biggest gear driving this. Um, but when we connect with our community, when we come together as administrators and we look at differentiated ways to deliver instruction, um, you know, this is kind of what we're, we're shooting for and what we're trying to do. So let's get into it a little bit here. Um, what I want to touch on today or what I, you know, what I consider sometimes the decision triangle, and um, it's the three big decisions I think that any school going into an e-learning program need to make. So these decisions are um, critical, and sometimes I feel like one in particular is overlooked too often. So, you know, we have the LMS or the learning management system. What platform are you going to deliver your e-learning classes or coursework in? The content, which is the one I feel is often overlooked, uh, and that is, you know, where are you going to get your online course content from? Are teachers going to build it from scratch? And so on. Um, so number three, of course, here is teach. Who's going to teach the courses? Uh, and that's also a critical piece for continuing culture in your schools keeping morale up and, and things like that. So I'm going to hit on all of these. And then uh, as I speak about each one, I'll stop and ask you to comment and share your own thoughts. I'd, I'd love to hear from everyone here. So I'm going to start with uh, the LMS or learning management system and, and what we've done in Palisade. So of course, an LMS is a platform for learning. Um, and obviously, when we went into this, we were looking for something very robust. 
we were looking for something that was heavy, that was very reliable and was user friendly. There are some LMSs that are difficult to manage, um, so we wanted to stay away from that because we knew some of our teachers were, were ready to go, but they maybe didn't have the technical ability to work with a heavy LMS system that needed a lot of uh, technical know-how. So the solution we went with was actually an organization called BlendedSchools.net, uh, and they use Blackboard as the provider. So we, we are using Blackboard, but it's hosted by BlendedSchools.net, um, and they have the content, of course. I'm going to come back to that when I talk about content. Uh, so Blackboard, or, you know, believe it or not, my first choice was Moodle. Uh, Andy probably will know that, but so Moodle was my first choice. But after evaluating eight to a dozen different vendors and products, you take you have to take you know, all pieces, all all uh, everything needs to be on your on your radar. And while I am a Moodle lover, that's for sure, um, we went with Blackboard because of the investment of content and the support from the organization BlendedSchools.net. Um, I want to mention though that uh, if I believe many people are tuning in right now on YouTube or folks in this room. I know we have three certified trainers here. So um, Google has a number of LMSs that are available in the apps marketplace. Many of them are very good. One that I've had great experience with is Haiku Learning. Uh, Haiku is a very, very good cloud-based LMS. They have Google Apps integration. One thing I really like about it is that it has single sign-on, of course. So whatever your student's network ID is and maybe their Gmail username and password, it's exactly the same for the LMS, so everything is seamless. I'm a big fan of uh, giving kids as few passwords as possible to access their content. Uh, it keeps a little bit of stress off the tech team from having to reset passwords. Uh, and it keeps those kids out of Andy's office, I think, as well. So um, so that's the LMS, and that's the idea be behind what we did and why we chose Blackboard. Any other preferences, any comments on Blackboard or Moodle or Haiku or anything that you are currently using that you like? I just, I just know that a lot of the schools in our area, they're looking for different things, and we, we keep sending them to the different places for them to evaluate. We try, uh, you know, I work at an ESC, so I, and for those of you that are not in Ohio, that's an educational support service center. So we try not to sort of tell them what to do because we don't want to prescribe anything, and I think it, it's up to each individual um, school. And the tricky bit, I think, is what you said, Rich, in the beginning, is that we're in this transition phase where uh, – Schools are going to make those decisions. The states are really reluctant in making the decision, especially in, in Ohio. So kind of whatever works at the time maybe won't be permanent, and I guess that's how I think about it. So if there's something that's better that comes along, just be flexible to, to look at that. I agree. It's a, it's a great point. And while we are on Blackboard right now, um, I joke, but it's only <laughs> half joking, that we may move to something else next year. I mean, if Blackboard – loses this fight. We see what's happening in the LMS world right now. Everything is evolving so quickly. And right. just like we saw Google Docs and now Drive moved, you know, become this kind of cloud-driven solution and we see other vendors and other publishers following suit. LMSs are in the same boat right now. It's a very dynamic, rapidly changing uh, field. So we're with Blackboard now. They need to keep up their end of the game though for us to stay right. with them. And we, I've right. been pretty honest about that, that we can move at any time. So Anyone else thoughts or, or ideas, concerns, questions on that? Hey, Andy, I think you're still on mute. Yeah, Rich, we don't, I mean, at Burlington here, we don't have cool. a... Gotcha. Uh, you're there now. Thank you. Oh, how about now? Good to go. Okay. So, uh, at Burlington, we have, we don't have a mandated LMS here, but we actually, a lot of our teachers have had success and are continually using Edmodo as their primary uh, LMS and it just seems like as far as on the user end for the kids it's a familiar interface and it's a comfortable interface in which in which it looks very much the aesthetics of Facebook um, and now with the adoption of, of Google Docs and Google Drive incorporated right in there it's really easy and especially on the iPad as well it's easy for the, the kids and the teachers to communicate and connect uh, through this one space uh, and it's it, it doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles it's really not a cumbersome program. It's, it's pretty clean and it's pretty um, intuitive for both the user and and the, and and the people that are the teachers that are creating the work. So um, just wanted to share that experience because I, I know in working at a school with 1,100 iPads um, and the Google Apps for Education suite, those two kind of work together and kind of build their own kind of organic uh, LMS without having to go out and get one. Plus, 
you know, at least on the Edmodo side, it's a free option and it's really well on, on most platforms. Yeah, great, great point. I'm a huge Edmodo fan. Uh, I used it actually when it first came out. I was still in the classroom and I used it myself, um, and I love it. I think it's a wonderful platform. You you hit it right. It looks and feels like Facebook, so it's inherent to kids already, um, and it's it's fast. It doesn't lag. It's a wonderful tool. Um, I don't know if it's robust enough to be a full LMS. I don't know if I would recommend it for a, like an online program, but the way that you're using it in a blended or hybrid solution, I think is awesome. Yeah. Really, really awesome. And it's a great, great platform and it's free, so you can't go wrong. I think just another shout out there. I think uh, I used WordPress a lot when I was in the classroom. Uh, WordPress? The full, yeah, the full hosted version. I still have my own website, I guess. And I used that with great success. And I think what I liked about it is that it has a public face, and so at least the, the standards in Ohio call for Common Core really calls for um, you know publishing online, publishing yep. real stuff, especially with like, the high school students. And that's something that I was a little hesitant with Edmodo and Schoology. They they both it's nice because they're blocked and sort of they're a closed loop system, much like an apps domain would be if if you wanted it to be that way. But then the public side of it, you know, if you're in a WordPress or something like that, makes it really easy to just say, boom, well this is published and your comment is published, and that's how I was able to cut down on, um, you know, like comments that weren't shouldn't belong. You know, I would awesome. tell my students, I said, in five years when you go for employment whatever you wrote in my class, someone's going to be able to find it. And I, I didn't have a single issue out of, I think I ended up with 2,000 some comments or whatever at the end, you know, total from students, you know, using it, comments and, and whatnot. And that worked really well. But I agree with you, Rich, too. Probably not a uh, full-fledged, you know, LMS, but really good for, for posting information, doing discussions and that stuff, so... Awesome. I know. Uh, I know some folks. Some of my colleagues have had a lot of success with BuddyPress and WordPress as well. I think it's awesome yeah. Um, yeah. when you're using that to, you know, do the things that you're saying. And, and we're encouraging our students to be self-publishers and present their work to a global audience. You, you know, you can't get much better than WordPress. That's for sure. Dimitri, thanks for joining us. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hello. We're uh, just getting into it a little bit here. So glad you could join us. It's great to be here. Thank you. I just had, I just had one more quick comment. Um, Thanks, Stace. Yeah, I feel like um, just back to Edmodo one last time. It would be a nice um, solution, a nice starting ground, um, mm -hmm. you know, for people who have not yet um, even explored an LMS. I feel like Edmodo is just a you know, non-threatening, just pick up and go solution. So for those that are looking to just, you know, get started. You know that's not a bad, not a bad option. Great point. You know, uh, it's really, really good because you don't want to. Uh, one thing I, I know you can't do, and I, I, it's very important, is that if you're going to have your teachers doing any type of blended or e-learning solution, you cannot overwhelm them. You cannot give them so much that they look at an empty Moodle screen <laughs> or an empty Moodle class and they have no idea where to go from there. I can't think of a worse situation. Um, so you're right. If you even want to start migrating to a spot where your district is promoting digital literacy and e-learning and blended learning, and you start with Edmodo as a, you know as a as a product that may continue uh, for some teachers and not others, maybe they go to a different platform. Great point. Great great place to start and get everybody familiar with you know developing online classrooms. And you're so, seeing, Rich, I just want to throw out. Yeah, sure, go ahead. See, there, there's some comments in the Google Plus page there. I don't know if you're seeing those. Oh, thanks a lot. I didn't go back over. I'm going to come back and check them out. I appreciate you reminding me of that. Let's see what we got here. Um, some folks got their master's degree online. That goes back to the idea of, um, you know, Andreas, you brought up the idea of college readiness. And yes, yeah, so, you know, we're pursuing online degrees and taking. Um, you know, online courses for our own professional development or our own trying to acquire our own uh, degrees or whatever program you're involved in, you'd think we'd want to promote that for our students as well um, and give them, you know, the ability to do the same and de develop those same literacies. Um, what happens to socialization of children I see posted here as well? Another great question. Uh, and it's something we're very aware of at Palisades, which is why even when students in Pennsylvania want to choose full online, um, in, in fact, it's one of the best reasons I can give for why we started a cyber center and why I invested in such a space. 
by developing a cyber center that's staffed by a teacher full time, our students who are out of the building or need face to face support or maybe have a group project even with an online class can collaborate in that space. And while we have a lot of students that ask us or re request to go fully online, I do my best actually to steer them away from that uh, because you know as mass you know as educators who are pursuing master's degrees, you know we're responsible for our own learning. But K twelve, I don't know that that's the right solution. There's always going to be a certain percentage of kids, um, you know I don't know what that percentage is. It's small who a full online schedule is needed and facilitates what what they're trying to accomplish. Maybe it's an athlete, you know maybe it's a musician. We had a, a student last year who traveled, uh, who's a mountain biker and he was going to mountaineering and mountain biking school which was I thought awesome but he needed some additional content so we took our online classes as part of that so yes I think we need to stay aware of students and that school is a social growing arena as much as it is an academic one um, and be careful who we promote and how we encourage kids to go fully online so jumping back into the uh, presentation here briefly, you know, the idea I mentioned that sometimes is often overlooked is content. Um, and the, the question really is, who's going to generate your content? I joked earlier about showing teachers a blank Moodle screen and letting them just have at it and, um, you know, kind of develop Moodle courses or Blackboard courses, whatever the platform may be. That's challenging, that's intimidating, and it takes a lot of time, an incredible amount of time. So when we made our decision to go with blended schools, one of the major factors was that they had over a hundred courses that were PA approved or Pennsylvania approved by or approved by our Pennsylvania Department of Education um, that were built. But not only were they built, it, it wasn't a canned solution. In other words, we didn't have to use exactly what they had. We could take a copy or duplicate their courses, and then our teachers could work within it to enhance some things, take away from some things if they thought it was too much, whatever adaptations they felt were necessary, they could do. So you can see why a, you know, a solution like that was valuable to me. Um, it gave our teachers somewhere to start from. It gave them the ability to you know, modify and adapt based on their instructional practices. And uh, I was a huge fan of that. Now, we use blended schools and Blackboard for grades 7 through 12. Blackboard's a very academic platform, so at the, at the lower levels, uh, in elementary school, we do have a solution. Uh, again, a lot of those students will come in for maybe uh, their specials, their gym classes, and things like that, but they're doing maybe a half schedule online or, or greater. Uh, some are fully online because that's what the, the family has chosen. Um, we use K-12 and the K-12 product for, for that solution, but again, um, I'm going to get into this idea about who's teaching the courses. We always use our our teachers to teach our courses, so I'll touch on that in a moment. Um, and then I just posted some links in the presentation here about the self-learning movement and the OER movement. If I had my way, I would really love to have an elective course in our high school where a teacher is monitoring a space, probably a you know some technical space like a computer lab or something, um, where our students can come in in a blended platform and choose a certain number of MOOCs or open courses or MIT open courseware um, and that would be their course you know a, a, almost an elective in digital learning um, and I'm pushing that a little bit I'd like to see that happen because as these you know the open education resources and the self-learning and all these MOOCs start to emerge uh, there's some powerful opportunities there for kids to you know really find their passion and see what they they like and you know get in their element so that's my, my take on content and it's actually the biggest reason why we chose Blackboard through blended schools was because of the quality of the content um, and I think that was important for us for sure. I think Anyone? Go ahead. Yeah, I, just, I think that's the biggest question we have. We have a, a lot of maybe unfounded fear that you know who's going to make all this stuff and if we move online or if I'm going to have a website or if I'm going to do Edmodo then who's going to do it and so I, I try to do as much hand holding as I can and you know set it all up for them and, and but I think it's Will Richardson who says you know we have to unlearn and then relearn and do a bunch of new stuff and I think that's where we're at you know we're all transitioning so not only are we gonna you know we're gonna push our stuff online or whatever teachers too we're gonna have to say well it's not all gonna be in a textbook it's gonna have to be online and do I even need a textbook and but where does that come from and who says yes and then what standards do we follow so there's like tons of questions out there but 
it's fun. It's that's, a, that's a great that's a great point because we actually ran into that problem last year where we were trying to you know we, we made the made the push where we're not buying any new textbook licenses going forward for a high school of eleven hundred. Um, so then the the next question was we, we we were using Apple Pages initially and trying to make EPUBs and push them out their iBooks, and then that then came the question as wait. Now I have to teach and I have to build a textbook at the same time. <laughs> and that was like, okay, you, well, yeah, just you just have the stuff. Just digitize it. So that didn't go over too well. And, you know, you know how that works in public education and where people go. So what we did was we found this uh, company called NetText. Uh, and we've been working with them uh, just starting this year. Uh, and they've actually, as part of buying a package through them, uh, they're, building course, they're building courses for us. And so... Um, I put up in the chat window here. It's it's just N E T T E X T S, um, and we actually have uh, one of their employees that comes in the package and he is with us every day of the week. He's actually working with us now, and he's starting with twelve of our uh, twelve of our teachers, and he's building the content for them. So the teachers are saying, "Here's what I want. Here's what I'd like to have," um, and then he's building the courses and designing it in conjunction with the teachers. And so the goal is in well, beginning next year every course of Burlington High School will be in this format. Um, and it's a really nice app because uh, it, it can be, it's a web based so teachers can create it through the laptop and then uh, the kids can download the app on their iPad, all the content is there, videos and so on and so forth, all, con all rich media. And uh, so they're building courses from teacher created materials that they've created along with going out and seeking different OER resources that are out there. Uh, so it's a nice um, you know, blend of the two, uh, building together this uh, autonomous uh, course, and as it updates, so you're not even locked into it either. So as as it locked as as it updates, or as things happen in the world, teachers can update their um, update their content through this through this application, and it sends the kids a, a push notification saying, "Hey, your your course has just been updated," or some major breaking history just happened, and Here's here's the update, you know. So it's it's really good. Again, we're not trying to sell you anything. I'm just I'm just trying to share the experience with NetTech. They're, they're really good, and we'll probably be hearing more of them uh, coming forward. So. Awesome. Uh, there's some questions over on the on the stream in Google Plus. I want to say Dan uh, Funston mentioned that uh, Canvas and infrastructure look like great tools. I've heard wonderful things. I've had limited experience, but I have heard the same. So thanks for sharing, Dan. Uh, Dave Lloyd asked a question about um, thoughts on a higher ed solution that would tie to Google Apps. Uh, yes, Dave, we mentioned um, Haiku. Haiku Learning is a—it's just a, a wonderful product, and it is Google Apps. Uh, it's in the Apps Marketplace. So if you just Google Apps Marketplace and then you go to the EDU section, you'll be able to find that um, great software. It's HaikuLearning.com, and it has Google Apps integration. Wonderful. It even has the ability to um, post and collaborate inside Google. Docs inside of the uh, inside of the learning modules, and then lastly, Patty Zamora asked about Edmodo for lower grades. Um, Patty, I teach a lot of online courses. One of those courses is building online learning environments, um, and I have a number of elementary school teachers in that course who develop and d eventually choose Edmodo as their as their option. It's simple to use. It's simple to log into. It has parent accounts. It's completely secured. There's no individual messaging. So you don't have to have it be too fearful of the idea of cyberbullying, like a private chat. Um, so yes, I think Edmodo works great in the uh, in the elementary elementary grades. You know, I mentioned this idea about teaching and something that I, you know, I keep saying I'm passionate about stuff. I guess I'm passionate about everything that I do in e-learning. But so with the teachers, um, when I took the position at Palisades, I was very very vocal about the fact that I, I felt that it needed to be Palisades teachers teaching our courses and it needed to be them at every turn or every opportunity that there was. If there's a niche situation where we need to outsource a course here or there, fine. But the bigger picture here is that we're, sh we're doing more than just offering an online option. We're shifting the culture of education. I mentioned earlier that we're in this process of calibrating what e-learning is and trying to figure out how it works best in K-12. I don't feel it's a responsible decision if a district outsources that solution and doesn't bring the capacity or the ability of their own staff, teachers, and administrators up at the same time. Um, so this whole idea of technical capacity, this whole idea of, 
uh, building ability and expanding know-how for our instructors, you know, is going to be beneficial over time. You know, if there's a couple online teachers, that will trickle down. Those skills will, you know, infiltrate other classrooms in the building across their departments, and it will give everybody the ability and the know-how to see, okay, well, if I want to move to a blended solution or if I want to use Blackboard as a, as a course management tool just to organize my class, or if I want to go to Edmodo, these are the options available to me. So that idea of building that value, uh, increasing that capacity, and really owning it as a district is critical. It's much more difficult to do it that way. It's easy to turn and say, uh, well, there's this turnkey solution here. Let's go with that because it's easy. But then I, I put this question in here. I said, well, what do you do? What do you, what do you do in five years? <laughs> what do you do in five years when there's more and more blended solutions and that pressure to make our students digitally literate, you know, digital citizens, that college and career readiness? Again, Andreas touched on that. What do you do then if you haven't already started the process of building the capacity? So not only is it good that they're local, so if our kids need help, they can come in and meet with their teachers. You know, not only. Not only is it good that um, you know they have the ability to work in the cyber center with students, um, you know, and, and all these things. I mean, it's just, it's just that's what we do. It's what we're trying to do. We decided to take it by the horns and promote what we're doing from the get-go. I think that's a great idea, especially since you're building up from the inside. We we see a lot too. Where it's almost like a threat where blended or online stuff becomes a threat or like here's something provided by a third party. The teachers see it as a threat. The district isn't really interested at all. But So it's always playing with, well, are you going to build capacity from the inside? Do you have the skill necessary and support and all that stuff? Or are you going to go with a third party? And then if they do go with a third party, a lot of the time the teachers kind of, they might rebel or you know that the replacement question is always there. This is going to replace me as a teacher in the classroom. Well, no, because you're still going to have to be there. And, but there's that danger zone. I think we're still dealing with. And I and I I great point. I had to deal with that in our district. But when I, you know, it, it wasn't a hard sell in our district when we looked at it from the the perspective that you know, it's our responsibility to keep the abilities and the and the know how of our teachers growing along with the rest of the education world. Um, and when I was so vocal about, you know, it has to be our teachers that, you know, helped alleviate some of the fear or it helped to, you know, let them know that there is some job security. We're not trying to outsource our teaching jobs. There's no question that in an online class or face-to-face -face class that teachers are needed. <laughs> That's impossible, um, you know, especially in the K-12 level. That may work in some higher ed formats, but um, in the, the K-12 letter, you need a teacher. You need that, you need that support. Um, and it's just something I feel like we need to do, and it's more difficult, but it's worth it's worth the challenge. So, you know, some other challenges, just you know, briefly here. Um, of course, the time. So, training the teachers takes a lot of time. Deploying the solutions takes a lot of time. Working with the families to see what their individual needs are. Again, this is that idea. The whole idea of mass customized learning, whether it's in an e-learning solution or in a face-to-face -face solution, the more customized learning becomes for our students, the harder work it is, the more time it takes. But is that is, is work and time enough of a deterrent for us not to do it? Not for us. We're, we're, we're really, you know, we, we know. We know what it's, it's taking us more time to do these things, but it's worth the, the effort because we know that's what's going to help our kids succeed. You know, some initial investments I posted here, of course, the training, equipment, um, professional development, the platform, all those things cost um, some initial money, but once this, once that initial investment was there, it was easy to recoup those costs by uh, students not leaving our district, to tell you the truth, and going to other uh, charters or cyber charters um, and keeping them happy where they are. Community buy-in was a little tough. A lot of times uh, the community, the family, our school board, uh, you look at an e-learning course or an online course and they're thinking, well, is that the same rigor that we're used to? Is that the same quality standard? Um, so it's been a challenge to, you know, make sure that we keep our courses at the same standard as our face-to-face -course, face -face courses have been uh, over time. So there's, I'm not saying it's not without its challenges. It certainly is. So, but there's some benefit there. And once you get in and once you use some of these solutions and, you know, 
I use people around me to help build our program. You know, I would encourage anyone here or anyone listening to uh, reach out to me at any time and see what I can help or what I can do to help you. I also posted some more ideas about, um, you know, Google options. I know I forget who it was asked about a Google solution for an LMS. Uh, this link here will give you uh, take you right to a blog post that I just drafted and I included this presentation in the blog post so it's embedded for anyone that wants to access these links or or content uh, in the future. Here's places I can be found on the web and then um, I'm just going to leave it to everyone here and let the conversation go for the next couple minutes before we tie everything up. Um, any final thoughts, any final questions, anything you didn't get answered uh, that I can help you with in the next couple minutes? Can you just talk a little bit about, Rich, how um, your timetable for your district, you know, from sort of start to where you're at now, are we looking at a couple of years, and, and how did you space that out? Yeah, good question. Um, so I think we were very aggressive in our, in our deployment approach. We were initially going to take a three-year approach uh, where we would start with the high school, move to middle, and then elementary. Um, but we launched the high school program in 11-12, school year 11-12, um, and we went right for as many courses as we could get in that first year. And then we knew we needed to move quickly, so we included the middle school and, set and elementary school programs this year. So um, August and September, there wasn't much sleep for me in getting those, those going, but I think I'm back to a normal job now, uh, a reasonable amount of time dedicated in my day to what I do. Um, it's tough, it's hard, it's a lot on the teachers. You know. I think it's important that you have somebody there to support them in that deployment, to support them all the way along, you know, from development to when they start supporting students and communicating with families. Um, that's what my role has become, and uh, I think it's worked really well. Well, no, I know it's worked really well at Palisades. You know, I go back to, though, that was a timeline that worked for us. Andreas, I think you even touched on this. You know, it's a very custom solution in e-learning program. So there's guides, there's ways, there's support. Um, there's people like me who are, I'm always willing to help, uh, but you really have to tailor it to what you're trying to accomplish and what you want to succeed with as a district or, or an organization. Um, I have a question. Um, in our school, we use Moodle. We used to use Blackboard. Now we're in Moodle. Um, and all our teachers are required to use it. Uh, and we're all face-to-face. -face. We have nothing totally online. Okay. But... Um, I want to hear your, your thoughts. Are also uh, teachers in other places well encouraged to to use it? Uh, we have teachers here who, who use it only for posting homework or just a syllabus, and that's all they do in a year in the whole year. <laughs> Some do uh, chats and other things, uh, online quizzes. Um, but in general, uh, if if you're face to face courses, how are, they, how are they using LMSs to, to support that and if they're just encouraged or, or forced to, to use them? Good question. So uh, let me speak from a high school perspective, at least in our district. We, um, last year was our, we started our online program. We had probably 20 full on-time learners or, you know, full, on, full online. I mean, they maybe came in for a course or two, but they were mostly online. But we had well over 100 students that took online courses. Maybe they were um, expanding their schedule because they wanted to graduate early. Maybe they were a few credits shy, and they were up in their, their course load to graduate in time. But we knew that it was something that we wanted to have for all students, no matter what, for the whole student body. So what we've started this year is that our entire English department, because every student basically takes English in their high school career, our English department has started to implement Blackboard as a face-to-face -to -face tool. So those classes are still face-to-face -face and traditional, but they're using Blackboard as a management solution. So even if a student never takes a fully online course, they'll get a lot of experience using an LMS, in this case Blackboard, in their English classes, and that will help us achieve that goal of college and career readiness that I was, I was speaking about. So I think using an LMS as a face-to-face -face support is equally powerful. I think it's, in fact, I think it's wonderful for that. Yeah. And uh, how about how well Blackboard and Google Docs integrate, or do you see, is there any way to make them uh, play well? We have not, at this point, uh, integrated them 
you know, too much. We have both. Students will develop, you know, let's say uh, an essay in Google Docs, share it with the teacher, post the link as their project submission. Um, so they, they use it, and they we, all of our students have Gmail accounts in apps as well. Um, there's supposed to be some blocks in, uh, in Blackboard that are, um, you know, helping with the Google integration piece. I haven't seen too many that are good yet uh, or, or great. Um, so we haven't done it too much. Now, uh, there is a, now you said you're using Moodle. I know there's a black, there's a Google Docs uh, tool for Moodle, and I can't think of it right now, Juan, but I can look at, yeah. I can take a look around and see if I can find it. Um, that for allows Moodle, you, there is, yeah. Uh, I've seen it, yeah. You've but seen it. Okay, great, yeah. great. So you're using it perfect. So, um, so that's, if, you're, if your organization is using Google Apps, that's a nice, mm -hmm. a nice solution. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, we mentioned Haiku earlier as well, and they have seamless apps integration as well. Another mm -hmm. another good option. Okay. Thanks. Oh, sure. Any other final thoughts or questions? Hey, I just want to say thanks to everyone. I appreciate you coming in today and, and listening. And there was uh, quite a few people tuning in on YouTube too. So thanks for coming. Um, if anyone's out on YouTube watching now, or for this group, of course. You know, reach out anytime. I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to help. I'm happy happy to share more uh, if if you need more. So, thanks again. All right. Thanks, thanks, Rich. Thanks, thanks all. Us. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. I'm going to cancel the or uh, end the broadcast now. So, take care. Have a good one. You too. Take Bye -bye. care. Hey guys, thanks. I ended the broadcast, so we're not live anymore. I just want to say thanks again to everyone in the room here. Um, you know, thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. Thank you, Rich. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thanks. Have a great day. I'll uh, I'll post some more on uh, on Google Plus about this, and then once the um, broadcast is published.